Um, so as I said, we're, we're moving into the closing round for our conference uh, today, and uh, we're very lucky to have with us uh, one more dynamic speaker who's going to be addressing the P5 plus 1 in Iran uh, nuclear negotiations, uh, the Lausanne uh, Framework Agreement, and the ongoing talks um, and the, the implementation steps beyond uh, the June 30 target date for concluding the talks. And uh, in he is Colin Call, the Deputy Assistant Secretary to President Obama and the National Security Advisor to Vice President Biden. And he has been uh, deeply involved in the administration's effort to negotiate a comprehensive joint plan of action uh, to address Iran's sensitive nuclear activities and has been working in and out of government for more than a decade uh, at Georgetown and elsewhere, the Defense Department, on the security challenges in the the Middle East. And uh, we're especially grateful to have him here today. Um, uh, we're taking him away from Camp David and the festivities and conversations there. Um, uh, but I think it's very important that uh, we have his voice here to talk about uh, not just the agreement, but the broader Middle East issues uh, that are being discussed up at Camp David. Um, and so uh, we hope to have him uh, talk about um, uh, what, a, what the completion of a final deal based around the parameters talked about in uh, discussed in Lausanne uh, would do to set back Iran's nuclear program, how the agreement would enhance regional security and that of our allies. And um, uh, before I ask him to come up and speak uh, and take a few questions after his, his talk, um, just note, uh, as Kelsey said, that uh, we at the Arms Control Association, along with dozens of other nonproliferation experts across the United States and around the world uh, judge the agreement that is emerging from these negotiations to be a, a net plus for, for nonproliferation. And uh, we wish Colin and the rest of the team uh, good luck with the Iranians uh, in the weeks ahead. So uh, Colin, thanks for being here. All right. The floor is yours. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Daryl. Um, Thanks to everybody here at the Arms Control Association for all the tremendous work you do every day in the nonproliferation and nuclear security and disarmament uh, arenas. Um, you also do a fantastic job in educating uh, the public on uh, enormously complex uh, issues to include uh, the issue that I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, Iran. Um, as Daryl mentioned, I'm, I'm here really to talk about the prospects for achieving a comprehensive diplomatic solution to the Iranian nuclear challenge, and I hope, perhaps most interestingly uh, for you all, address a number of concerns and criticisms that have been expressed about such an agreement. Um, I hope that my remarks will be a useful companion to what I thought was a really terrific panel uh, with Richard and Ariane. And those of you, uh, I didn't actually know uh, Ariane very well until very recently when I realized that she's uh, teaching the class I used to teach at Georgetown. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in any case, I'm, I'm sure she's doing a much better job than, than I did, although I guess we'll see when the teaching evaluations are in. Um, I, know she, <laughs> I know she's having fun. I miss being in the classroom for sure. Um, as all of you know, from day one, uh, President Obama has been committed to using all instruments of national power to prevent the emergence of a nuclear armed Iran, uh, an outcome that we believe uh, could set off an arms race in the Middle East and raise the specter of a nuclear war in what is already the world's most troubled uh, region. Uh, to accomplish this objective, our administration has pursued a dual track approach, combining unprecedented sanctions and pressure with a willingness to directly engage Iran and our international partners in the so-called P5 plus one, the other UN Security Council members plus Germany to find a diplomatic means to ensure that Iran's nuclear program is used exclusively for peaceful purposes. We took an important step towards this outcome in November of 2013 when we reached alongside uh, the P5 plus one, uh, the Joint Plan of Action, the so-called JPOA, uh, an interim nuclear accord with Iran that froze Iran's program in place and rolled back some of its most troubling dimensions to include its stockpile of 20% uh, enriched uranium while we continued negotiations to achieve a comprehensive solution. On April 2nd, as was mentioned in the previous uh, panel, we released the parameters for such a deal. If finalized over the next two months, the deal we are negotiating will effectively prevent the emergence of a nuclear armed Iran by closing off the various pathways whereby Iran could pursue a bomb. Notably, an attempt to break out, so-called break out, by producing weapons-grade uranium 
at one of Iran's two enrichment facilities, Natanz or Fordo, a plutonium path using the Arak, that's A-R-A-K, uh, not Iraq, the country, apparently they're completely different places, uh, the Arak heavy water uh, research reactor, uh, or uh, what some call a sneak out uh, at new uh, covert uh, facilities. So let me say a few words about how the deal, if completed, uh, will block these pathways. As it relates to enrichment, for the next 10 years under this uh, deal, Iran's centrifuges will be cut by two-thirds uh, from uh, around 19,000 today to a total of 6,000, only 5,000 of which will be operational. All 5,000 will be present at Natanz. All 5,000 operational centrifuges will be at Natanz. And all of them will be the most basic IR1 models. In contrast, in the absence of this deal, Iran would likely install and begin operating tens of thousands of additional centrifuges, including thousands of much more advanced models in a very short period of time. For the next 15 years under the proposed deal, Iran will also reduce its current stockpile of 10,000 kilograms of low enriched uranium, enriched up to the 3.67%, uh, which if further enriched to weapons grade would be sufficient for as many as eight nuclear weapons, under the uh, deal that we're negotiating, they would reduce that stockpile by 98% uh, to a working stock of about 300 kilograms of low enriched uranium, which is a fraction of what is required for a single nuclear weapon. Meanwhile, the deeply buried Fordo facility would be converted. It would no longer be a place where enrichment can occur or uranium can be stored. The result? For a decade under this deal, breakout time, which is the time it would take upon a political decision to do so for Iran to produce one weapon's worth of highly enriched uranium, that breakout timeline would be extended from the current timeline of about two to three months to more than a year. That cushion in our assessment provides ample time to deter Iran from going down this road. It would provide us plenty of time to detect it if they tried and marshal an effective enough response to stop them in their tracks. And for years beyond this point, beyond the 10-year uh, point, stockpile limitations and other constraints on Iran's enrichment program would produce, in our assessment, a longer breakout timeline than exists today. The deal will also close off the plutonium path. Once construction is complete in the status quo, the Arak reactor, as currently configured, could potentially produce one to two bombs worth of weapons grade plutonium every single year. Under the deal we're negotiating, however, Arak would be redesigned to produce zero weapons grade plutonium. The spent fuel from which the, this plutonium could be extracted will also be shipped out of Iran for the life of the reactor. And Iran will be barred from building a reprocessing capability that would be necessary to separate bomb grade plutonium. These steps taken in combination, we believe, shut down the plutonium path using Arak forever. What about sneak out? Under the deal, we'll also put in place the toughest transparency and verification requirements ever negotiated, providing the best possible check against a secret pathway to a bomb. From the outset, Iran will implement the so-called additional protocol to their safeguards obligations, which will allow the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, to inspect both declared facilities like Natanz and Fordo and Iraq and Esfahan, and undeclared sites where illicit activities are suspected or may be underway. This obligation, the additional protocol, is permanent, as is Iran's continuing obligation under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the NPT, to never produce nuclear weapons. The proposed deal will also place every link in the nuclear supply chain under international surveillance. For the next 25 years, the next quarter century, inspectors will have access to Iran's uranium mines and mills. And for the next two decades, they will have access to Iran's centrifuge production, assembly, and storage facilities. Throughout the life of this deal, in addition, all purchases of sensitive nuclear equipment will be strictly monitored. And as part of the transparency measures under a final agreement, Iran will also have to address IAEA concerns about the possible military dimensions of its past nuclear research. Let me be absolutely clear about something. This deal is not about trust. Okay? Frankly, we don't trust the Iranians. This deal is not about that. It's about verification. Right? It's not even Reagan's old phrase of 
trust but verify. This is distrust and make sure you verify. And if any point Iran breaks its commitments under this proposed deal and goes for a weapon in the open or in secret, we're much more likely to detect it and we'll have much more time to respond under the proposed agreement than would be the case otherwise. So the constraints and the verification measures in this proposed deal are significant. Now, of course, Iran's willingness to sign up to something like this is not out of the goodness of the regime's heart. They expect something in return, and that's where the issue of sanctions relief comes in. So they expect uh, that there will be a reciprocal commitment by the United States and our P5 plus 1 partners to offer meaningful relief from nuclear and proliferation-related sanctions. But again, let me be clear. Iran must verifiably complete its implementation of nuclear commitments before it receives substantial US, EU, or UN sanctions relief. This could happen relatively quickly, but only if Iran acts quickly to meet its commitments. Even then, many sanctions will be suspended, as Richard talked about in the previous panel, not terminated. And sanctions will only be ended once Iran has restored confidence in the peaceful nature of its program. And throughout, there will also be clear procedures in the final deal that allows both unilateral and UN sanctions to snap back into place if Iran cheats. Taking all of these elements into consideration, the accord outlined in the April 2nd parameters, if finalized, is a good deal. It's a good deal for the United States, and it's a good deal for the world. And when one considers what a world looks like without this deal, a world in which Iran's breakout timeline rapidly shrinks from its two to three month period already, a world in which its stockpile of enriched uranium grows, a world in which Iraq becomes a plutonium factory, and our ability to detect a covert program diminishes rather than increases, and we get back on the road to a nuclear-armed Iran, a military combination, or both, when one compares that world to a world of the deal, the conclusion that this is a good deal becomes incontrovertible in our judgment. Nevertheless, that hasn't stopped a number of folks from, po from pointedly criticizing the proposed deal. It's worth noting, as many of you in this room know, that more than a year and a half ago, we heard similar skepticism about the JPOA from most of the same folks. Yet these criticisms ultimately proved unfounded. And some of the JPOA's biggest critics today argue that it should be indefinitely extended. They went from describing it as an historic mistake to a great deal. This track record notwithstanding, the arguments against the final deal we are working on must still be taken seriously. And we do take them seriously because this is deadly serious business. So in the time that I have left, I thought that I would address some of the major criticisms that we've heard about the proposed agreement head on. Some of our critics contend that the administration is so desperate for any nuclear deal with Iran that we're willing to settle for a bad one. Nothing could be further from the truth. Indeed, if we were so desperate for a deal that we were willing to rush to a bad deal, we could have had one in July of last year or November of last year when the JPOA was originally set to expire. But instead, we decided to extend the JPOA not once but twice to keep negotiating to drive towards a deal that met our bottom lines. So there's simply no empirical reality to the notion that we're desperate for a deal. We could have taken one a year ago. Now, because of the parameters that have been agreed to, we're close. We're much closer to a comprehensive deal that achieves our bottom line objectives. But we're obviously not across the goal line yet. And let me assure you, if the Iranians backtrack on the parameters, or if unresolved issues related to sanctions or inspections are not resolved in ways that ensure Iranian compliance with a comprehensive agreement, there simply won't be a deal, period. Other critics reject the deal we are negotiating on the grounds that there is a better deal out there. If we just step back, dial up the sanctions, rattle the saber, make more military threats, and drive the Iranian regime to dismantle its nuclear infrastructure completely and forever. There's just one problem with this line of argument. It's wishful thinking. We've seen this movie before, and spoiler alert, it doesn't end well. In 2005, after a two-year suspension of Iran's nuclear program, the Bush administration refused to accept a final nuclear accord unless it mandated zero enrichment, 
and associated infrastructure. So we've run this play before, the United States has. And what was the result? Starting in early 2006, Iran went from 164 centrifuges, that's 164 centrifuges, to thousands of centrifuges. The United States, because of this position, rather than Iran, was viewed as the intransigent party, which made it very, very difficult in the latter part of the Bush administration to marshal the type of effective pressure that we've been able to marshal in the last several years against Iran. And it took the better part of a decade to get the Iranians back into serious negotiations and bring the world with us in those negotiations. And it only happened because President Obama succeeded in 2009 and 2010 in reversing the narrative, making it clear that it was Tehran, not Washington, that was to blame for the diplomatic impasse. This is what allowed us to ramp up effective pressure and build an international coalition to support our efforts to put meaningful and verifiable constraints on Iran's program. Moreover, it is not at all clear why today's proponents of a so-called better deal believe that Iran will fold and that they would fold in time before they cross the nuclear threshold. After all, this is a regime that has mortgaged its domestic legitimacy in the face of withering international sanctions on defending the country's nuclear program as a national right. And this is the same regime which two decades ago, during the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, was willing to suffer perhaps one million casualties and $600 billion of economic damage. And it still took them eight years to agree to a tie. So why do critics believe that Iran today is likely to completely capitulate just because we want them to, or just because they say they should? Because no bona fide Iran expert, inside or outside of the government, believes that. None. There's no reason to think that if we abandoned the good deal that we've placed on the table, one that the rest of our P5 plus 1 partners have signed up to as tough but reasonable, if we abandoned that in favor of a unilateralist, maximalist approach, that the international community would come with us. Indeed, running that play, running the play that our critics propose, pulling back and attempting to unilaterally escalate the pressure would likely backfire, producing less international consensus and thus less net pressure on Iran. That would be the very definition of self-defeating. Ultimately, if we go on our own, insisting on conditions that neither Iran nor, most importantly, the international community can accept, we're likely to end up with the worst of all worlds, the end of diplomacy, an unconstrained Iranian nuclear program, a shattered international consensus around sanctions, and as a result, a greater likelihood of an Iranian bomb, a military confrontation, or both at a time when there's already so much turmoil in the Middle East. In our view, that's a pretty high price to pay for wishful thinking. Another criticism one hears focuses on the proposed sunset provisions of the deal. Because some of the constraints in the proposed deal loosen over time, our critics charge, this deal, quote, paves Iran's path to the bomb 10 or 15 years down the road. But let's get something absolutely straight. Iran already has a path to the bomb today. And blowing up diplomacy doesn't get you off that path. Nor, frankly, would military action, which would delay the program for significantly less time than the duration of the deal we're talking about here. Additionally, military action would likely incentivize Iran to kick out inspectors and double down on their efforts to build a bomb to deter a future attack. In our view, that is hardly an enduring solution. Indeed, when one considers what is necessary to block Iran's path to nuclear weapons, no other realistic alternative gets you a decade of a one-year breakout cushion, a generation of insight into their entire nuclear infrastructure, and permanent commitments on AROC, the additional protocol, and the NPT. No other alternative gets you that. And if 10, 15, or 20 years from now, Iran violates its NPT obligations and resumes its march towards nuclear weapons, no option available to deal with that threat today will be off the table down the line. In fact, some of these options will be far better because we'll know a lot more and we'll have a lot more capabilities. So let me conclude by addressing one final criticism, and I'm going to linger on this a little bit longer because it's important. The concern that the proposed deal would provide Iran with a windfall of cash 
enabling the regime in Tehran and the Revolutionary Guard in particular to escalate their destabilizing activities and facilitate their domination of the greater Middle East. Some critics have even gone so far as to argue that, quote, a richer Iran is more dangerous than a nuclear-armed Iran. Now they tell us. <laughs> this concern, in all seriousness, should be taken seriously, and we do. But there are several, I think, fundamental problems uh, with it. For one thing, it is not at all clear that Iran will spend the majority of its money from sanctions relief on troublesome foreign behavior. Because Iran is in such dire straits economically, Iranian spending in the immediate aftermath of a deal is likely to focus on domestic priorities. That is, at least for some period of time, on butter over guns. As a result, consider this. As a result of U.S. and international sanctions, the Iranian economy is probably 15 to 20 percent smaller than it would have been otherwise. And it will take Iran a long time to dig out from this economic hole, even with substantial nuclear-related sanctions relief. Our oil sanctions alone have probably deprived Iran of over $160 billion in oil revenues just since 2012. Because Iran and Iran's economy is in such disrepair, the majority of new revenues are expected to be used to address economic needs, including shoring up Iran's budget, building infrastructure, maintaining the stability of the real, and attracting imports. Indeed, the scale of Iran's domestic investment needs alone is estimated to be at least a half a trillion dollars, which far outstrips the benefits of sanctions relief. President Rouhani's political imperatives lend additional credence to this assessment. Rouhani was elected on a platform that included economic revitalization, and Iranians are, ex are expecting tangible economic benefits from constructive engagement with the international community. Politically, Rouhani and other Iranian leaders will be under immense pressure to deliver economic improvement once Iran starts receiving sanctions relief. Of course, despite these objective economic and political imperatives, it is certainly conceivable that the regime could choose instead to devote additional money to support Iranian operations abroad. And the unfortunate reality is that many of these foreign operations are not very expensive, which is why Tehran continues to fund them despite sanctions and will likely continue to do so whether or not the sanctions are maintained. Much depends on what type of actor Iran ultimately chooses to be in the region. It is conceivable, although far from inevitable, that a nuclear deal could incentivize Iranian moderation. It is also possible that it won't. Those of you who follow Iranian politics closely know that there is a major debate among Iran's fractious political elites. Some pragmatic elites seek greater integration with the international community and more normal relations with the world and other regional powers. Other hardliners, however, clearly aspire to dominate the greater Middle East via militant proxies. There's no doubt about that. A deal might empower pragmatists by giving them a big win, potentially allowing them to claw back more influence in Iran's foreign policy and push domestic reform. By demonstrating the benefits of constructive engagement with the international community and dealing a blow to those elements within Iran who thrive under a sanctions economy and resistance to the West, it is conceivable that we would see a situation in which Iranian leaders begin to place greater emphasis on growing Iran's economy, re-entering the world community, and lessening Iran's provocations in the region. But it is also possible, and we have to be mindful of this, that the Supreme Leader could seek to placate or compensate hardliners in the aftermath of a deal by doubling down on what he calls resistance. Because it could go either way, the nuclear deal that we're negotiating is not premised on making a big bet on Iran's future geopolitical orientation. Let me say that again. The nuclear deal that we are negotiating is not premised on the assumption that Iran will change its stripes in the region. It simply is not. So let's be clear. The potential nuclear deal is not a grand bargain with Iran. We do not see it as such. We are not banking on the regime transforming itself. But we do believe that the deal makes sense regardless of what type of Iran emerges in the aftermath of a deal. The deal is also not a permission slip for Iran to continue to make trouble in the region. And we are communicating that to them very, very, very clearly. If, and it's a big if, if 
Iran begins to moderate its behavior after a deal, there may be opportunities for further engagement to de-escalate regional tensions. But where Tehran persists in destabilizing actions or chooses to escalate them, we will continue to push back against these activities and defend our allies and partners in the region. That is why we will continue to call out Iran's leaders for their detention of American citizens, for their anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic statements, and their human rights violations. And it's also why, irrespective of a possible nuclear deal, our sanctions targeting a broad array of Iran's non-nuclear activities, including human rights violations and terrorism, will remain in full effect and will be vigorously enforced. It is also important to understand, and this is, a, this is a very critical point, it's important to understand that many of Iran's gains in recent years in the Middle East are more a byproduct of the weaknesses in many regional states where Iran and its proxies operate rather than a manifestation of Iran's inherent strengths. So the solution is to build stronger partners and pursue political solutions across the region that help stabilize key countries and make them more immune to nefarious influence of all varieties. That's why in places like Iraq and Lebanon, where Iran attempts to use proxies to exercise undue influence and build these parallel institutions, we will continue our work to strengthen national institutions and militaries to harden them against foreign interference. And in places like Syria and Yemen, we will continue to promote political transitions and inclusive power sharing arrangements to end the violence and ensure that all parties, not just Iran's proxies, have a say in governance. Moreover, even as we pursue a nuclear deal, we will expand our already robust cooperation with Israel and other regional partners, including the Gulf states, to push back against Iranian threats. With Israel, our security cooperation is as strong as it's ever been, despite obvious policy disagreements. And we are committing and committed to strengthening it further. Indeed, no president has done more for the security of Israel than President Barack Obama. That's just a fact, and it's not going to change. When I ran the Middle East office at the Pentagon in the first three years of the Obama administration, Israel was in my portfolio. I traveled to Israel 13 times. The only country in my portfolio I visited more was Iraq. I went there 16 times because we had more than 100,000 forces there. But in all the four, of all the 14 other countries that were in my uh, portfolio, no other country received the attention that Israel did. I had more than 100 meetings in my three years with senior Israeli defense and political leaders. So I know how much hard work has been done by this administration from the very outset to make Israel safer. Our administration has worked with Congress to provide record-setting levels of U.S. security assistance, nearly a billion dollars over and above our foreign military financing for, uh, for the Iron Dome system to defend Israel against uh, Iranian proxies, whether they be in Gaza or in southern Lebanon. And we provided Israel with the F-35 fighter and other state-of-the-art technology to ensure Israel's qualitative military edge against any potential adversary in the region. Our intelligence cooperation has also become deeper than ever. And all of this, when taken together, and I could list quote after quote after quote after quote from senior Israeli official, is unprecedented. In the Gulf, too, we have taken important steps to protect our partners. On any given day, there are 35,000 U.S. forces in the Gulf region stationed there to deter aggression and defend our partners against it. We're also working to expand the defensive capabilities and collective security potential of our Gulf Cooperation Council partners by improving their air and missile defenses, their ability to coordinate on maritime security, critical infrastructure protection, and cyber defenses, as well as their counterterrorism capabilities. That's the purpose of the meeting the president is hosting today with Gulf leaders up in Camp David. Of course, some of our critics want us to go a step further. They believe that we should condition the removal of nuclear sanctions on changes in Iran's destabilizing behavior, including holding a nuclear agreement, uh, not, not removing any nuclear-related sanctions until Iran ends all of its support for terrorism, militancy, subversion, and calls for Israel's demise. By the way, we share the desire for Iran to end all of these abhorrent practices, and we will continue to push Iran to alter its behavior in all of these areas. But the nuclear sanctions were put in place to pressure Iran to accept a nuclear deal out of recognition that, as destabilizing as Iran's activities are today, a nuclear-armed Iran would be exponentially more dangerous 
It would be able to hide behind a shield of a nuclear deterrent to advance its hegemonic ambitions and support for terrorism and militancy across the, the region with impunity. And its actions would now carry the risk of sparking crises that could spiral into a regional nuclear conflict, a risk that does not exist today. So the purpose of these sanctions and this deal is to reduce that risk, not to resolve every problem we have with Iran and every threat and challenge that Tehran may continue to pose. A similar rationale, of course, drove arms control agreements during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, another regime that engaged in reprehensible people at home and abroad, brutalized its own citizens, sponsored proxies, and threatened our allies. The United States made repeated arms control agreements with the Soviet Union, even as they continued to engage in behavior that was far more threatening to our interests than Iran's activities are today. Why? In order to reduce the nuclear threat and prevent a nuclear war. As my boss, the vice president, reminded an audience just last month, Kennedy didn't condition the partial test ban treaty on the Soviets surrendering Cuba first. Nixon negotiated the SALT Treaty without conditioning it on Moscow ending its assistance to North Vietnam. Reagan demanded to Gorbachev, tear down that wall, but he didn't condition nuclear talks at Reykjavik on the Soviets tearing down the Berlin Wall first. And throughout this entire period, we never demanded that Moscow recognize the legitimacy of global capitalism or stop its support for communist regimes and insurgents in Africa, Central America, and elsewhere as a precondition to step back from the brink of Armageddon. These presidents pursued these arms control agreements with the Soviets because nuclear weapons pose an existential danger that must be dealt with. And refusing to do so unless all of our other concerns are met would leave us far more vulnerable to the threat of nuclear proliferation and devastating conflict. We didn't do it during the Cold War. We shouldn't apply that standard, a different standard today. Moreover, there's simply no reason to believe that conditioning sanctions relief on Iran fundamentally changing its behavior throughout the region would work. Insisting on this highly ideological regime in Tehran, ending all of its objectionable behavior in the region, is tantamount to insisting on regime change as a condition for a nuclear deal. It won't work because the regime won't accept it, and even more importantly, the world would not back this play. Meaning it would, it would leave us, not Iran, more isolated, and it would leave Iran freer, not more constrained, to cause mischief. Last but not least, we can be just as confident that maintaining the current nuclear-related sanctions or attempting to escalate them in the absence of international consensus around that escalation won't be sufficient to solve the problem of Iran's nefarious activities either, since Iran has already proven both willing and able to engage in these activities despite the sanctions. Ultimately, it is geopolitical constraints, not financial ones, which will limit greater Iranian activity in the region. That is why a strategy that simultaneously pursues a nuclear deal and takes steps to support our allies and counter Iran's destabilizing actions makes more sense than rejecting this deal, as our critics would have us do, in the fanciful hope of driving the Iranian regime and its proxies out of business. So, despite all the criticisms leveled against the potential deal with Iran, it is clear that the deal we are pursuing advances core American interests. Is the deal we are negotiating perfect? It is not. Will it solve every problem in the Middle East? It most certainly will not. But if completed, it represents the best available option to address the looming threat posed by a nuclear-armed Iran, and in the process, would make the United States, our regional allies, and the world a safer place. So thanks for your patience, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Colin. Oftentimes, uh, one invites an administration official to give a talk about a serious topic, and it's not as substantive as you'd like, but that was a very meaty and serious uh, and thorough presentation. So thank you. So we have, we've got time for several questions, and I want to give the reporters in the room um, the first crack uh, at, uh, at Colin. So I see a hand over here from, from Barbara, who has uh, strategically positioned herself closer to the moderator. Uh, so, and, and then we'll come up here for another question up front after Barbara. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Thanks for your spirited defense of, of the agreement. Um, we see reports all the time that the Iranians are continuing to try to procure various elements for centrifuges, other nuclear parts. 
How are you going to define material breach in the comprehensive agreement? How are we going to know what is going to trigger this, this attempt, at least, to snap back some of the sanctions? And what is, is a, a, a relatively minor concern? Will it be precisely defined? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to judge how it will be defined. Um, I think that clearly what's allowed under the agreement and what's not allowed will be clearly, defi will be clearly defined. Uh, the degree to which, uh, you know, a particular, a particular action is defined as a material breach, I just, I don't know that yet. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but it is, it is uh, something that we're going to have to come to closure on in the, next, in the next six weeks. I will tell you on this specific issue of procurement, a major uh, uh, piece of this uh, agreement, of course, will be to establish a uh, procurement channel. Um, so that any sensitive uh, nuclear-related technologies or, or associated dual-use uh, uh, technologies will have to be purchased through this internationally monitored uh, cha channel. Anything that's purchased outside that channel, by definition, will be illicit. Uh, so I, I think that's actually a, a quite a, an important part of the transparency and verification uh, mechanisms that, uh, that, that we're going to uh, put in place. All right. Uh, we'll take this question here. If you could identify yourself, please. Hi, Jessica Schulberg from the Huffington Post. Uh, thanks for coming. That was very compelling. Um, could you speak a little bit about the process by which the IEA would grant or gain access to certain sites? There's been a lot of talk within Iran about military sites being off limits, and then we hear different things regarding the additional protocol. Yeah, so, I mean, under the additional protocol, the IIEA can request access to any site in the country that they suspect uh, there's illicit nuclear-related uh, uh, activity going on. it. So um, that means any site is open for them uh, to request. Uh, now, Iran could deny that request. Um, uh, if they deny that request, um, they would have to be able to provide to the IAEA information to settle the dispute in the absence of getting physical access. If they can't do that and they still deny uh, access, uh, then there will likely be an adjudication mechanism under the agreement uh, they will have a finite period of time to come to closure. And if Iran uh, is basically required under that procedure to provide access and they do not, they still do not provide access, then it's a violation of the agreement. And any of the enforcement measures, snapback or other measures, will kick in at that, at that stage. So under the additional protocol, there are no places that are off limits. Obviously, the IAEA would have to uh, uh, make the case that they need access to it. Um, for, uh, you know, to, to uh, verify compliance with the, with the agreement. Um, but there aren't going to be off-limit places. All right. We're going to go to the back. Um, I see Eli here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. If, um, if crippling sanctions didn't deter Iran from continuing to build centrifuges, why do you think that snapback sanctions will deter them from cheating on the agreement? I think that, look, I think the deterrent is more comprehensive, frankly, than snapback. I think that the signing on to the agreement to begin with represents a strategic decision, a calculation by the regime that a world of the agreement in which they accept meaningful constraints on their program uh, uh, is better than a world in which they are isolated, pressured, uh, and uh, under threat. And to the degree that violating the agreement puts them back into a world in which they are isolated under pressure and potentially under uh, threat, um, that alternative would be worse. Um, so I mean, I, I, guess, I guess you would, should direct that, to, uh, that question to Iranian officials uh, and ask them that. I think it is our judgment that um, sanctions have had a meaningful effect in driving Iran to the table. It's nonlinear, as you note, uh, Eli, because, of course, we had gradually escalating sanctions from 2006 through 2010, and then a significant increase in uh, sanctions from 2010 onwards, if you kind of put the, put the plant the, uh, the flag at the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1929 in June of 2010, and then obviously the NDAA and SASADA and other steps that the Congress took, as well as the EU oil embargo and uh, uh, et cetera, you had a substantial ramping up of, of, of pressure. I think it's our assessment that it was the combination of that pressure and, frankly, some leadership changes in Iran as a consequence of their 2013 uh, presidential elections, those two things coming together uh, uh, affected Iran's calculus and, and their determination uh, to, uh, to strike a deal. Um, now we'll see 
by the way, it's it's not not clear it'll it'll happen. Uh, I think that the chances are are, are decent and improving, um, but not inevitable. If Iran strikes this deal, it's 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 basically them uh, coming to the realization that a world with a deal is better than a world uh, uh, without a deal, where their pressure uh, will be increasing. I think you know Richard's uh, point in the previous panel is an important one too. I think a um, you know what. If they violate the deal, it would be a major strategic decision as well, and it would put them at enormous risk, an enormous risk of unraveling all the progress they would make in, in unwinding the sanctions. And frankly, uh, it would spark an international crisis that could put, put folks on a path to a military confrontation, which the regime likely wants to uh, avoid um, as well. All right. Um, I think there was another question in the back. Um, Chervin, right there. Hi, uh, Tom Kalina, Plowshares Fund. Uh, Colin, thank you very much. And Daryl, thank you very much as well. Colin, a question about uh, timing. Uh, assuming the Corker bill becomes law, as it looks like it will be, uh, how will that impact the administration's timing uh, and timeliness of suspending sanctions? And as part of that question, um, do you expect the Iranian regime to, if you will, kind of pre-implement the deal in order to accelerate the time frame where sanctions can be lifted. Thank you. You know, under the terms of the Corker legislation, if if you know something uh, nearly identical passes in the House, um, there's about a 30-day uh, review period, and um, it could be extended um, under certain circumstances uh, for for a period of time. So I think the answer is that the that the entire deal would probably be delayed in implementation until that review period uh, is is over. Um, so it would delay. It, it, it could delay Iran taking meaningful steps in the first uh, 30 days, and obviously, because of the nature of the law, it doesn't allow any uh, statutory sanctions to be waived. That is, suspension of U.S. Uh, unilateral sanctions uh, during that period. So I think the delay is is kind of baked into uh, the review period. Of course, Congress may not take the entire review period. They may look at it uh, for a shorter period of time and and uh, and pass their judgment and then. And then we would go uh, from there. Whether Iran would pre-implement, I think, again, a question probably better directed towards Iranian officials than me. Um, if they started to take steps tomorrow to remove the calandria from Iraq and dismantle centrifuges and do other things, I'm not sure why that would be a bad thing. Um, uh, I don't see any indication uh, that they're doing, uh, doing that yet. Um, and uh, under the terms of the deal we're negotiating, they don't get major sanctions relief until they've taken the major steps associated with dialing back their, uh, their nuclear program. So, you know, obviously the sooner they do that, the sooner uh, relief might kick in. And if, if they calculate from that that it serves their interest to start taking steps to roll back their program earlier rather than later, I'm, I'm not sure why that would be a bad thing. Um, but I don't, haven't seen uh, any, any signs that they've done that yet. All right, and before we just take the next question, let me just ask you, Colin, uh, while we have a chance, if you could just describe uh, in general how the talks are proceeding, what the, the, the schedule is, who is meeting between now and 30th, how, how are the remaining details of the JCPOA based upon the Lausanne framework uh, being put together? Yeah, I mean, we've we've had a number of uh, expert level meetings and political now political director uh, level meetings. Um, much of the discussion, um, at least out of the out of the outset, and this has all been reported in, in the press, uh, focused on sanctions uh, and the and the timing and phasing of uh, of uh, sanctions. Um, but we continue to have conversations with them on other technical uh, issues related to the annexes, on enrichment capacity, you know, research and development, uh, and, and other things. Um, we don't have a firm timeline. That is when Wendy and her team, you know, will will meet on the calendar, and when uh, Secretary Kerry and Zarif will get back together at the at the ministerial level with the with the rest of the P five plus one. Um, I think at the moment we're trying to make as much progress as we can at the expert level in almost constant conversation with uh, uh, with um, uh, the Wendy Sherman level of the political director level, um, you know, meeting every couple of weeks. And then as we get closer to crunch time, I expect that the ministers will lock themselves up in a hotel room uh, somewhere in Switzerland or somewhere else uh, and uh, and hammer out the remaining details. All right. Um all right, a couple other questions here. Um, into the middle, please, uh, Mr. Levine, and then we'll come over here to the left. Colin, thank you for a splendid presentation. Uh, nothing to object to at all, but I... Can you tell my wife that? Yeah. Just in general. Yes, yes. 
But I do think that at the very technical level, there will still be people raising questions that you have not quite addressed. One would be what to do about the problem when conversion or downblending of uranium uh, is not easily achieved and how reversible it might be. A second would be does the additional protocol really apply to a case in which Iran is, is suspected of nuclear weapons activity that does not involve nuclear material, but rather involves something like explosive testing? And thirdly, uh, will the PMD issue be specifically tied to sanctions relief, or will it be sort of a floating obligation in the agreement? Thank you. Yeah, I handle those in reverse order. The, the, on the PMD issue, the answer is yes, it will be tied to specific sanctions relief. It will not be something that's just floating that uh, out in the ether, and Ar Iran will have to um, come to resolution uh, on the key issues associated with, with the PMD investigation with the IAEA before they get the major tranche of uh, sanctions. Of That's relief. made clear in the Lausanne it framework. And it's, and it's actually, by the way, from a timing perspective, this is just a question of political will on, on Iran's case, right? They can, they can provide access to people, places, and things relatively quickly. Um, it may not mean that the IAEA finishes its investigation in that time period, but Iran has to give the IAEA the access required uh, uh, within uh, that time period to get the major tranche of sanctions relief. And as Daryl mentioned, that's spelled out uh, or the, alluded to in the, in, the, in the parameters of April 2nd. Um, does the AP uh, apply to, I mean, in essence, you're asking, would, would the additional protocol, as we're uh, understanding it, apply to a Parchin-like uh, uh, situation uh, in the future? And the short answer is uh, yes, in, in, in our, in our uh, understanding of what uh, would be allowed. If there, if there was, um, because the agreement will also rule out of bounds um, certain weaponization-related activities. Uh, so in the Parchin case where the IAEA alleges uh, or suspects uh, that there was explosive, uh, conventional explosive testing related to the possible experimentation surrounding an implosion uh, warhead, uh, those types of activities would be verboten under the type of agreement uh, we're talking about. And in our interpretation of the additional proto protocol, at least as far as I understand it, would in, uh, allow the IAEA to get access in a future Parchin-like uh, 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 scenario. Um, as, a re as, a re results, as it relates to downblending, look, currently, uh, you know, the 10,000, how do you get from 10,000 kilograms roughly of LEU at 3.67% in various forms, although mostly gas, as you, as you know, down to a working stock of 300 uh, kilograms? Um, the answer is uh, dilution. Not, I don't, we're, not, I don't, we're not looking at oxidation, which I think raises the issue. You know, under the, under the joint plan of action, they dealt with the 20% stockpile so a, through a combination of dilution and oxidation. And some critics raised the problem of could you, you know, oxidation can be reversed so you turn the powder back into gas. Now, one of the ways the JPOA addressed that, of course, is that they didn't have the piping uh, or the uh, technology to do that, and any and setting that up in and of itself was a violation of the JPOA, and there's no evidence uh, that they did that. Um, but under this, I mean, going down to 300 kilograms, we're not talking about putting the other 98% of the material into powder. It's going to have to be diluted. What happens to that material is obviously uh, part of the negotiation. Um, uh, there are various uh, mechanisms. Does it get shipped out of the country? Does it get sold uh, on the uh, open market for reactor fuel? Um, uh, you know, is it diluted and stored in the, in the country? I think there are different ways you could get at that. Um, but we have to be confident that they don't have a working stock of above 300 kilograms of, of uh, low enriched uranium. All right. A question right up here. Hi, uh, Rebecca Gibbons, Georgetown University. Hi, thanks for a great talk. I'm wondering, as we have six weeks left, what personally is most worrying to you or what impediments do you see um, for the, to get to a deal in the next six weeks? And another way of phrasing this is, if we do not get to a deal in six weeks, what do you think are the most likely factors that would have caused that and what are the implications moving forward? Well, look, I, I think getting a deal is going to take political will uh, on all parties. I think the parameters um, establish a, f a great foundation uh, and also, frankly, a, a degree of momentum. Not inevitability, but a degree of momentum. 
Um, my sense is that Iranian leaders, uh, you know, if you, you see the way in which the Iranian negotiating team was welcomed back home by, by a lot of the Iranian public, I think there's a real sense, uh, pent up expectations uh, in the Iranian populace uh, for their leaders to deliver on a deal. I imagine, uh, you know, there's real politics in Iran. I imagine that puts uh, some pressure on them uh, to get across uh, the goal line. Um, Obviously, they have uh, issues that they're going to insist upon. We have issues that we're going to insist upon. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I, I foreshadowed a number of the areas where we're going to you know, take a pretty hard line and that things like we're not going to give uh, a bunch of upfront sanctions relief in the absence of, of uh, uh, significant implementation uh, of, uh, on the Iranian side in terms of their commitments under uh, the agreement. There's not a something for nothing principle associated uh, uh, with this. That's clear in the parameters that, uh, that we released and we're gonna, we're gonna stick to that. Um, there are also these issues obviously as it relates to sensitive site access and the, 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 the uh, clarifying the writ of the IAEA uh, as it relates to inspecting um, uh, you know, potentially uh, Clandestine activities uh, somewhere, um, and so we're and we're going to be pretty hard uh, on that as well. I'm sure there will be conversations on on research and development and other topics that are that are uh, controversial, um, which is a reason which is the reason why a deal at this point is not inevitable. I think it is more likely than uh, had you asked me six months ago, um, but you know more likely doesn't mean it's a it's a it's a done deal. Things could still. Uh, come off the rails. I think the good the good news is is that I think we have a fair amount of P5 plus one consensus. Well, first of all, we have total consensus around the parameters, and we have a and I think we have a good amount of uh, of consensus around those issues where there's controversy, and that's important because being able to bring uh, the rest of the P5 plus one with us uh, is important uh, it, as we get as we get down uh, to the wire. Let me say one other thing on on sensitive site access too. I think that. There's been a lot of um, focus on, on one particular part of the verification regime, and that is <coughs> sensitive site uh, access. I think it's useful, which is important and critically important, but I think it's useful to think about this, uh, this whole thing holistically. Um, a lot of people presume that all it takes for Iran to develop a clandestine nuclear weapon is to you know, dig another hole in the ground like they did with Fordo and fill it with stuff, and suddenly they have a nuclear weapon uh, the next day. Um, that's actually not the case. They have to dig the hole and not get caught. They have to uh, have a source of uranium and not get caught. They have to turn that uranium into, in the first instance, yellow cake and then convert it uh, into hexafluoride gas. They have to have a source of centrifuge components, construct those components, and then be able to deliver those uh, to the facility. And they have to put it all together without getting caught. And the 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 thing that's, I think, uh, quite promising about the parameters on this deal is that we have visibility across that entire chain, right? For a generation, we will have access that uh, beyond anything the IAEA has had in Iran before to the uranium mines and mills, uh, as well as their centrifuge production, storage, and assembly uh, uh, facilities. Uh, and, uh, and then you pile on top of that the ability to go uh, to uh, access locations where the IAEA suspects illicit material is. So if you're Iran and you're calculating how likely it is that you can get away with a secret program, you're a lot more likely to calculate that you can get away with it today or in a world without a deal uh, than you are uh, in a world with the deal. And I just don't know any other option that gets you nearly as much confidence that you would detect uh, a secret program as the deal that's on the table. There's no other uh, I mean, in the absence of you know invading and occupying the country, uh, it's it's hard to imagine um, a, a a realistic negotiated um, uh, inspections and verification uh, system that would be more likely to detect uh, an Iranian sneak out than the one that we're talking about. Yeah, I, it, that's a great point about the layered approach to verification. I mean, there have been several questions here about the additional protocol. It is more than just the additional protocol. It's important to remember. Um, all right, we've got time for one or two more questions before we, we wrap up, um, and I want to keep moving around the room, and I want to go all the way to the back um, to the person in the white. Please all identify the yourself, you. yes. <laughs> Leandra Bernstein, Sputnik International News. Uh, so it looks like the House is going to pass the Iran Nuclear Agreement Act. Things could happen, um, but I spoke with... Uh, Senator Menendez, after the Senate passed it, he said that uh, congressional review would strengthen the U.S. Negoti negotiating hand rather than weaken it. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, 
and, and also uh, why, once again, just why the administration changed its position on accepting the congressional review? You know, I think, I guess, I guess we could, you know, I think there are compelling arguments cutting in, in different directions about whether review itself intrinsically uh, uh, gives the negotiators more, um, more leverage in the negotiations. I mean, clearly the fact that Congress is skeptical, irrespective of the Corker legislation, um, you know, means that the Iranians are under no illusion uh, that this is an easy thing for us to do politically. Uh, uh, they understand that the deal has to be tough and that we have to be able to defend it or we uh, won't be able to sustain it in our own political system. And in the absence of doing that, uh, it's difficult for us to have a deal and for them to get the sanctions relief uh, they, uh, they want. Now, whether you needed the Corker legislation to communicate that to the Iranians or, or not, I guess you could, we, you know, there could be a debate about that. Um, I think that the administration is satisfied that the legislation as currently written as it came out of the Senate um, you know, provides a useful structure for Congress to weigh in uh, on the deal, a predictable structure uh, for, doing, uh, for doing that. And hopefully if, if the House passes something, it, it, it tracks what the Senate, uh, what the Senate passes. Uh, and the, the President has said he'd be willing to sign it at that point. Why uh, did we change our position on the Corker uh, bill? It's a, long, uh, it's a long story, but the short of it is there were, the, there were certain things in the original legislation that were extraordinarily problematic uh, uh, for us. There were, there were elements of the bill that, uh, that on a plain reading made it sound like uh, it gave Congress an up or down vote on the deal itself, which uh, our lawyers and the president himself had uh, enormous concerns about from a precedent standpoint since executive agreements and political understandings along the lines of this deal have been negotiated hundreds and hundreds of time uh, without Congress weighing in uh, to include uh, all of the status of forces agreements uh, that we have protecting our troops all over the world. So pretty important national security uh, uh, issues. And there is not a precedent for Congress weighing in on that. And I think there's a concern that Congress setting the precedent of weighing in on every executive agreement in the national security space uh, could be quite problematic for the conduct of foreign policy, not just by this president, but by any president, Republican uh, or Democratic. So it was useful when Senator Cardin and others got behind clarifying language that what Congress is ultimately voting on is to approve or disapprove the ability of the, of the president to use statutory authority to waive sanctions, which of course these are congressionally imposed sanctions and it's, it is within, uh, clearly within Congress's authority to weigh in on that. And we've always said from the beginning that Congress had a role to play in this inevitably because sanctions will never be terminated down the line unless Congress terminates them because they're not in the power of the executive to do it. So I think once the legislation clarified that this was not an up or down vote on the deal, but an up or down vote on uh, the sanctions portion of it. That helped. There were also some uh, problematic certification requirements uh, associated with the deal, especially on terrorism, that are extraordinarily important in terms of the behavior uh, that we're worried about on the Iranian uh, side of things but are extraneous to the nuclear issue per se and would set up a circumstance in which the worst actors in Iran could engage in the worst activities around the world and do it to sabotage the deal, which doesn't strike me as something we want to encourage. Uh, uh, so we took a pretty hard line on certification requirements in, uh, that is certification for snapback or, or, re -imp or imposition of additional sanctions, that those had to be tied actually to nuclear related activities as covered by the deal as opposed to being extraneous uh, from the deal. And so when that uh, uh, provision was modified uh, and in addition to uh, what I said previously, we became more comfortable uh, with, with the legislation. All right, before we go to the last question, I wanted to ask you a question, Colin, that, that relates to today's uh, GCC summit at Camp David uh, and to the New York Times article that appeared this morning, uh, David Sanger wrote, um, quoting an unnamed uh, leader or official from one of the states that uh, is represented at the meeting, to the effect that um, uh, we uh, will match Iran's uh, enrichment capacity step for step, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, um, I mean, our answer at the Arms Control Association would be that it's, it's clearly not in Saudi Arabia's interest or anyone else's interest to um, reject a deal that limits Iran's capacity and then to get into a uh, centrifuge race. But could you just give us a, a sense of what uh, 
if this is actually being communicated uh, at, at Camp David uh, today, uh, what, what you would anticipate the, the response from uh, President Obama and others at the meeting might be to that co sort of uh, comment? Yeah, it's a kind of strange argument. Um, let's keep in mind, Iran's nuclear program started under the Shah in the 1950s. And Iran's enrichment program started in earnest in the, in the mid to late 1980s when they started to acquire technology from the AQ Khan network. Um, so the fact of, Iranian, of Iran's nuclear infrastructure and their enrichment program is not a new fact. Right? It has been a reality in this part of the world uh, for, I mean, do, the, do the math, 60 years. And so here's the weird part about the logic. Their, pro their program's capacity, including their enrichment capacity, is here. In the absence of a deal, it'll go to here. With a deal, it'll go to here. And yet somehow this, compared to this where it is now, or this where it will be in a couple of years, has a higher potential for the Saudis and others acquiring nuclear capabilities that would tee them up for nuclear weapons. How does that make sense? How is that world worse on net than a world in which their capacity is higher than we could describe today or in the future in the absence of a deal. It makes absolutely no sense. Now, it is true that countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE and others have uh, nascent uh, nuclear programs at various levels. And the Gulf countries at various times have talked about consortiums and, and cooperating on nuclear energy. And we think that there's a role uh, for uh, nuclear energy in that uh, part of the world. We have a so-called one, two, three agreement uh, with uh, the UAE, which facilitates uh, nuclear uh, cooperation. We don't think that there's any need uh, for these countries to pursue, pursue uh, domestic enrichment, uh, neither for the domestic economic uh, reasons because uh, it doesn't make uh, much sense uh, to produce this indigenously, nor for the security reasons, uh, since these countries already sit comfortably under a quite robust uh, security assurance from the United States. So it's not clear why uh, uh, pursuing these capabilities would make them any safer uh, than uh, they uh, would otherwise be. And a major topic, obviously, of the GCC summit up in Camp David today is clarifying a couple of things uh, to uh, the leadership of, of the GCC. One is actually describing what's in the deal and what's not in the deal. Because there's at least as many myths uh, among our partners and allies in that part of the world about what was actually negotiated as there are here in the halls uh, of Washington. And I think when Secretary Kerry met with his uh, foreign ministerial counterparts from the GCC last week in Paris, he was able to really go into great detail on the nature of the deal and found that a lot of them came away much more reassured simply by having the facts about what's in and what's out and realizing that this deal relative to either the status quo or the future in the absence of this deal puts substantially more constraints on Iran's program than there would be otherwise and therefore addresses the motivation uh, uh, that has been bandied about in the New York Times and in other places. And then the second component that's talked about, uh, 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 that's going to be talked about up in Camp David, of course, is clarifying our overall security assurance to uh, the Gulf states. Again, this is nothing new. I mean, you go back to Eisenhower, Nixon, and Carter. Uh, it's been a mainstay of American foreign policy since uh, uh, the beginning of the Cold War uh, to make it clear that any external attack on our partners in the in the Gulf region is an attack on the vital interests of the United States, and that we reserve uh, all means to respond uh, to that attack in in uh, in consultation and uh, joint action with our our partners. And the presidents will will make that clear today uh, in the joint uh, in the uh, in the joint statement. I mean, I should say, he made it pretty clear at the 2013 UN General Assembly uh, speech that he gave where he made it clear that we would use all instruments of national power, including unilateral military action if necessary, uh, to defend our uh, partners uh, in that part of the world against external aggression. So there's that. The last point I would make is um, I, it's not clear to me why other countries looking at the totality of the Iran package would say, you know what, I want to do that. Uh, you know, suffer decades of crippling sanctions, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, roll back a program you'd invested a lot of money in and uh, provide more intrusive inspections. Um, I'm not sure that the average country looking at that suite of options saying, that looks like a great path forward, <laughs> right? So it's, it's hard in the totality of history to judge Iran as coming out of a winner uh, in, this, in, in this equation. And I think 
when countries recognize that there are better ways to achieve their economic and security uh, interests than going down the pathway that Iran took, uh, that, that we should be able to persuade them otherwise. All right. Um, I actually think that's a very good point to end on. We're uh, over time. Um, please join me in thanking Colin Call for being here and for the hard work that you've done and the hard work that's ahead. Uh, this won't be the last time that we uh, go over thoroughly the uh, P5 plus one and Iran talks. Um, and uh, we're moving towards the conclusion of our session today. Um, and I want to thank uh, everybody here who has uh, stuck with us through this uh, detailed and uh, rich uh, discussion on various uh, subjects. I want to thank my uh, hardworking staff, um, uh, Greg Tillman, Kelsey Davenport, our Non-Proliferation Policy Director for their, their moderation work, uh, Tim Farnsworth, our, our Communications Director, uh, Shervin Tehran for her work pulling all this together, and thanks to all of you for your support and for being here. We will have uh, a transcript of all of this, believe it or not, thanks to Federal News Service online soon uh, with a priority on uh, Colin Call's uh, remarks this afternoon. So thanks a lot for being here, and we are adjourned. Thank you.